and a spiritual man working out together. The whole purpose of this is to develop a spirit in us that will help us overcome the things of the flesh. That's the purpose of it. And, and uh, I've exercised all my life. And I've lift weights, uh, been a pro boxer, I've played football, uh, I've done a lot of different things, been a stunt man for almost 20 years. And so I've always used exercise and working out, lifting weights, hitting the bag, jumping rope as a way to stay physically in shape. But what that it's done for me is it's kept my spirit at a level where I am, have my eyes open, my ears attentive, and, and my face set against the things that tear down the flesh. And that's, that's both carnal things, the things we eat, but spiritual things, the things we look at, the things we hear, the things we think, the things we say that tear us down. Um, I want to start off with a little rope jumping. This is a rope. Now, this is a tow rope, actually. But uh, I always conform everything into my image. That's what I like to do, except when it comes to spiritual things, I hope that I'm conforming into the image of Christ. Uh, I tape everything. I tape my wife, my kids, my dogs, my pets. And uh, as you can see, my weights, as you're going to spend time with me, you're going to see that I tape everything. I may end up taping this film before it's over. All right. So this thing here is heavy. It's a pretty heavy rope. I haven't weighed it, but it works you out. And uh, I've been telling my boys, I have three boys, three girls, and a wife that obeys once in a while. And uh, I've been telling them for years that jumping rope is the singular most best thing that you can do. Of course, they believed me for a little bit, but they didn't really believe me until a scientific research said that jumping rope was the single most best thing that you can do. Now, you may say, boy, whew, he's puffing after that little bit of I am, but you'd be surprised. Jumping rope with a heavy rope, this thing weighs, I think this thing weighs probably, probably two pounds. And so it really does work on you. And so, we won't do any more of that. Because uh, if I'm gonna talk to you, I gotta have my breath. Okay. I want to give you a couple scriptures. And uh, the first thing I want to read to you, this is, a, this is a scripture everybody uses, to the negative. You see, fat armchair prophets and preachers and pastors that have never done a day of exercise in their life will tell you that bodily exercise profiteth little. Well, as far as getting to heaven, bodily exercise isn't going to get you to heaven. But what it may do for your spirit, and getting your spirit to a place where it'll rise up to meet the spiritual battles of this life, it'll profit you. So it says in uh, 2 Timothy 4, uh, or 1 Timothy 4, 7, it says, bodily exercise profiteth little. But over here in 2 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And what I want to uh, draw in on is fighting the good fight. The next scripture I want to take you to comes out of 1 Corinthians 9. And I'm probably assuming you don't have your Bible and that's all right. You can just listen. But 1 Timothy 9, 24, and I'm going to just read a couple of verses. Know ye not that they which run the race, all of them run. But one, only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. In other words, run lawfully, run legally, run correctly, run with order so that you might obtain the prize. He goes on to say that everyone that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Everyone who competes in physical games must compete 
correctly. And it says that he is temperate in all things. He's under control in all things. He keeps his body under. He keeps his spirit under. He keeps his spirit subject to the right things. Now they which do this do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we do it, we, we obtain an incorruptible crown, a crown that does not perish. I therefore run, Paul says, not as uncertainly. I don't run uncertainly. When I run, I run with an intent and a purpose. And it says, when I fight, Paul says, I so fight, not as one that just beats the air. And we'll be getting into that a little bit when we put the heavy bag up. But I keep my body under, and I bring it into subjection to my spirit. Lest by any means, when I have preached to others, that I myself might be a castaway. I want to take you to back into the Old Testament. And uh, we can look up here, and I've got this written down. 2 Samuel 11. And this is really what I want to put in our spirit to give you kind of a, um, oh, a warning and, and hopefully to instill a little bit of fear in you. Um, 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 2 is the account of David. He has pretty much silenced a lot of his enemies. He's in Jerusalem. He's in the palace. He's been established in his kingdom. And here's the uh, account. And it came to pass after the year was expired. At the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon, besieged Rabbath. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. What's going on here? David, it says, in the springtime, at the time that kings go to war, where was David? He stayed home. Where should he have been? He should have been at the battle. He should have been leading his troops. What was he doing? He was resting. Was he training? No. Was he preparing himself for battle? No. He sent Joab. And it came to pass at evening that David rose up from his bed. Why? Well, you're not going to sleep good if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. David rises up, walks out into the terrace, and sees a woman naked bathing down below. And then he inquires of her, sends for her, commits adultery with her. Well, every, if you're a Christian, you know the story. I won't belabor the story. And, um, but how did it happen? Why did it happen? It happened because David was not prepared for the battle. David took his ease. He had relative peace. He had the, the Spirit of God. He had the victory of the Spirit in his life. And so he sent others to do what he himself should have been doing. And so as a result of it, he fell. This little workout room, some people call it a torture chamber, this little workout room is designed for me to stay in shape, keep my spirit in shape, and keep my body in shape. So that at any time the Lord calls me, I can go. If I'm called to work out with some of the guys in the ministry and work on the lawn crew or work outside and do some physical labor, I can do that. If I'm called to go out and, and to uh, preach the gospel and to go prophesying to go do meetings, I can do that too. I keep my body under, I keep myself physically fit, I keep my spirit at a level where the enemy doesn't overcome me, where my thoughts don't overcome me, where words don't overcome me, where the things I see every day out there in this world don't overcome me. And uh, it doesn't happen, I mean, I don't overcome the things of the spirit just because I work out, but it is part of life. In our culture, you need to have something like this. Unless you work construction, unless you work a physical job, you need to have something like this. Because God didn't create this body to sit for 8 to 10 to 16 hours a day. He didn't create us to do that. He created us to move around. He created us to work. So, now, giving you a little bit of a spiritual uh, foundation here. 
What I want to give you next is I want to actually help you get started if you don't work out or if, if you work out from time to time, but you want to get the best and the most out of your workouts if you lift weights. That's basically what I'm going to be dealing with is lifting weights, hitting the bag, jumping rope, doing some of these things, but mostly lifting weights. That's also another research, many researchers have found that probably weightlifting is the single best form of exercise that you can do if you do it right. To lift weights just to get big muscles won't work your cardiovascular system, won't work your heart, won't work your lungs, it won't work your, your system, your metabolic system. But if you do it right, it will. And, and the way that I've always lifted is I've done exercises in progressions of three. In other words, uh, like for instance, I'll curl, I'll do a set of curls, um, I'll do a set of bench presses, and then I'll do a set of pull downs. And I'll do this without resting. And then after I do my set of three, then I'll rest for maybe 60 seconds, maybe, you know, two minutes. And then after, and I, and I do this for a long time, and for the sake of uh, the tape, I'm not, I'm not, you're not going to go through a whole workout system, I mean, because it might be an hour and a half, two hours. Uh, you get probably tired. Some of you would have heart attacks watching me. Some of you would probably pass out watching me. Uh, some of you would be so excited and so thrilled and desire to go lift weights, you're probably on your way out that door right now going to buy yourself a set of weights. Just wait till after this little workout session. Now, what I want to tell you is everything that you do, everything that you lift, the first thing you have to remember is it has to be heavy enough to make you work but it has to be also not so heavy that it hurts you. Okay, you say, well, how do I know? Well, you know by, by breathing. In other words, anything that you lift, you should be able to breathe with. What I mean by that is you take in a breath, and I'll just go ahead and start. Um, this is my, my curling bar. And uh, for me, this is a good weight. Now, I'll add a little weight, actually, but I warm up with it a little lighter. But if you notice, I take in, I breathe in when I'm ready to do the work. And when I get to where I need some additional energy, I'll, I'll blow it out. And that's what I mean by breathing with it. from popping. Just quite literally, that's what it does. It keeps your veins from popping. 
Okay, so you just take a half a breath, take it up, breathe out. six reps of anything. You want to keep your, your reps up to five or six at least, and I would recommend probably eight or nine when you start. I've, uh, I'm using more weight, so with me I'm, I'm down to five or six reps. Okay, this is a pull down machine, same thing. You adjust yourself when you, so you feel comfortable. On the power stroke, you breathe out. Okay, now I got a lot of weight on these things, so. Okay, that's the first, that's set number one. Why don't you give us a pause here? Okay. I want to give you a few more scriptures now. Say, well, just getting into the workout. Well, you know what? This ain't even the workout. And uh, this is the workout. See what it says back here? Event staff. You know what the event is? Overcoming the things of the flesh. The event is not just being saved. You know, you can be saved by not doing much of anything, just agreeing that you're a sinner and agreeing that God loves you and sent his only begotten son, died on the cross for your sins. You can be saved believing that. But whether or not you ever grow and ever come to a place of maturity where you have a good relationship with the Father by the Holy Spirit in the power of Jesus' resurrection, and overcome the things of the flesh. I'm not just talking about your diet and what you eat, but overcoming the spirits that work constantly against you and I to destroy our thought life, to destroy our pure uh, service toward the Lord and toward mankind, toward humanity. To do that, you're going to have to get a diet of this. You're going to have to get into this. And you're going to have to do more than read it. I want to read out of Romans 1. I'll just concept I want to give you now is who your enemy really is. Your enemy is not the devil. I'm just going to tell you, your enemy is not the devil. Jesus said to all the believers that have been filled with the Spirit, he said, you have authority over the spirits. You have authority over the spirits. He said, don't rejoice that you have authority over the spirits, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But the fact is, a born-again, spirit-filled believer who walks in his integrity will have authority over the devil. So the devil isn't really your problem. You know what your problem is? You. Let's be honest. Have you ever lusted since you've been born again and filled with the spirit? Have you ever had illegal desires? Have you ever had illegal appetites, emotions, passions? Sure you have. And we've all had to learn by falling and by suffering. And Jesus himself learned obedience through the things that he suffered. But our enemy is really in here. Now we know, we know that the enemy, that the devil, that the, that the spirit that now works in the hearts and in the lives of all of the people of the earth, the, the enemy that we call the devil, Lucifer, the fallen angel, we know that he is alive and we know that he works in darkness and we know that, that he works through spiritual wickedness. But the fact is he can have no authority or no power over you but what you give him. So the, the, the problem is really boils down to your selfishness, yourself. James puts it like this, let no man say when he's tempted that he's tempted of God, for God tempteth no man. But every man is tempted when he is led astray of his own lusts that are in him. So we find that the problem is really self. That's my problem. 
And what does the enemy, what does the enemy that we call the devil do? He merely gravitates to selfishness. He merely comes and knocks on the door of self. Wherever we're alive to self, that's where he is going to be there to help us to fulfill all selfishness. Okay, so first, or Romans chapter 1, 26 says this. Because, I'll start at verse 25, because they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature, or we can say creation, worship create creation, more than the creator who is blessed forever, for this cause God gave them over to vile affections. Okay, God gave them over. In other words, God's people were given over to vile affections. Well, what is that? Okay, let's go to Galatians 5.24. Galatians 5.24, and this is, Paul says, I have fought the good fight of faith, I have overcome, I have finished my course. 5.24 says, in the same spirit, they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. For if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now, this follows Paul's teachings on the things of the flesh. Galatians 5 talks about the things of the flesh. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these. But what I want to draw your attention to is verse 24. You that are Christ's had better crucify the things of the flesh in you. I have to crucify the things of the flesh in me. I have to take the hammer and the nails, and I have to crucify myself. I have to be willing to put the knife to my throat. I have to be willing to discipline my spirit. How do I do that? Through all the works of self? No. By asking him to help me, but by taking personal responsibility unto myself and doing it. See, that's why the world has such a hard time with the church. Have you ever seen the bumper sticker that says, thank God, we're, we're not perfect, we're just forgiven. And then the other bumper sticker, a picture of a cat hanging over a chin-up bar saying, hang in there, baby, hang in there until Jesus comes back again. It gives such a weak, mealy mouth, weak, neat, spineless reflection of Christianity. We're hanging in there till Jesus comes. I'm not hanging in there, I'm overcoming and it gives a picture of, well, we're not perfect, we're just forgiven. It gives a picture of a bunch of people that take no responsibility for what they do. They take no effort to overcome, but they're just forgiven. So we can do whatever we want to do. Thank God we're Christians. Thank God we can be forgiven. You say, this guy's nuts. What's he getting so excited about? I'm getting excited about overcoming the enemy of my soul, which is first, selfishness in me, and second, the enemy of my Lord and the enemy of this earth and the enemy of all mankind that wants to manifest and wants to provoke and wants to build up that selfishness in me so that I'll walk off the path. Who's going to stop him? The Lord in me will if I let him. But I'm going to have to be strong. I'm going to have to fight. You know, there were a representation for each one of the 12 tribes that went to spy out the land. When they came up to the Jordan River, Moses said, go in and spy out the land. The representatives from every tribe. There were only two that came back with a good report. All 12 saw the abundance of Canaan. Two had a good report. You know why? Because they had a spirit in them that was disciplined, ordered, and they were overcomers. So they saw the goodness of the land. They also saw the giants. But you know what they knew? They knew that God in them was no match for those giants. Those giants, it wasn't a match. You know what it means, no match? It means there's no contest. It means that God in them could overcome those giants. They weren't worried about the giants. But see, the people who had their eyes on self and, and keeping their life and saving their life, those people, they came back and gave a bad report. Yeah, the fruit's good. Yeah, the bananas are big. Yeah, the grapes are good. But the giants are huge, and there's no way we can overcome them. I say that the things of the flesh, the spirits of the enemy, 
that torment us and that present things to us every day, these things are giants to most Christians and most people. They've seen the most famous preachers in this country fall to sexual immorality and sins and lust and all these things. And they say, who, why do they even preach these things? Everybody knows that nobody can overcome lust. Nobody can overcome the things of the flesh. Why do they even preach these things? But the Bible says that you can. Jesus was our example. Paul, Elisha, Elijah, Esau, all, not Esau, who's the guy, uh, um, Anyway, slipped my mind. Uh, but there are many that overcame. There are many that, that had a testimony that they overcame. And, and we can have that same testimony. But you have to set your heart to it. You have to set your spirit to it. Um, what do I want to do next? Um, I want to put up the bag. Give me a little pause here while I set this bag up. Okay. We got this bag up. And I'm putting my gloves on. Now, I was a pro boxer, heavyweight champion of the Navy, and uh, Pacific AAU heavyweight champion, da 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 da, and I won't bore you with all the titles. But um, anybody can do this. This is a great, great exercise for overall body tone, for cardiovascular work, working your legs, coordination, and the bag doesn't hit back. So it's relatively safe. Um, Enoch. Enoch was the one that walked with God and was no more. I don't know why I couldn't think of his name. I said Esau. Please forgive me. I'm not a heretic. So, and what I recommend that you do, this bag, this is a 78-pound bag. They come, I believe they come one bag lighter, and they come about two bags heavier. But uh, this is a good, a good weight for people who are beginners. I've got it taped because through many years of hitting these things, um, I, I stretched it out along this area. And um, what I recommend you do is get the official um, <clears throat> bag gloves and either wear a uh, thin set of um, probably leather like driving gloves underneath them, or at least wrap your hands and wrap your wrists. And so, but this thing, I just work it, I just work it like it's, uh, like it's somebody I'm sparring with. And it's not important to hit it hard. It's just hit it, and, and, and hit it square. What you want to work on is just working the bag, walking around it. Don't, don't just stand here and hit it and say, boy, this is exciting. This is invigorating. Because you won't get anywhere. You gotta, you gotta move with it. And it's just like life. You know, you stay stationary. Not only are you not going anywhere, but you're a good target. And uh, it's like everything else. You need to have an objective. And when you hit the bag, the objective is you have an area that you want to hit. Don't, don't just hit haphazardly. Paul says, I so fight, not as just beating the air. What he means is, when he fights, when he punches, he aims at something. He knows what he's doing. And you want to work probably two to three minutes. And just like lifting weights, if you'll notice, I breathe in and then I I let air out as I hit. <clears throat> and the reason for that is it's just, it's natural. One of the things that I always tell people when they're lifting or 
boxing, running, whatever they're doing, don't do anything that isn't natural. Example, um, let's come over here. You've probably seen people when instructed when they curl um, to stand upright, to keep your back straight, keep your arms to your sides, and just do this. You would never lift anything like that. You would never lift anything heavy like this. You would never, uh, it's not natural. When you go to lift something, you get situated to where you feel comfortable, and when you grab it, you get comfortable, and then you, you may want to rock a little bit with it, or do whatever you have to do to be comfortable with it. <clears throat> if I try to keep my back straight, I'd probably pull about three major muscle groups. Not gonna do that. Say, that's not according to the book. I'm not a book, I'm a human being. I live and breathe and talk and walk. So I move with the weight. I move with it. I, let, I incorporate about five muscle areas for every exercise. Bodybuilders isolate muscle areas. For you and I that want to work for strength, stamina, and endurance, we need to get to where we incorporate several muscle groups when we do something. I'll tell you why a lot of people lose coordination. They lose coordination because they isolate muscle areas. Your bicep and your tricep oppose each other. God made us so that the bicep and the tricep, because it opposes each other, that's what gives us the ability to do this. If the bicep and the tricep were both in agreement, you couldn't do this. You need the tricep to oppose the bicep so you have tension, a dynamic tension that causes the body to be able to work. What you need to be able to do is you need to be able to work out and lift in such a way that you're incorporating different muscle areas. All the muscles coming up, I work my stomach, my pecs, my biceps, my forearms, my neck, and my traps, and my delts, deltoid. I work all of those together, and I, and I, I, I actually, I actually flex them. I, I get to where I can learn how to, how to put them into action. I can curl without using that if I want to, but I have found over the years that by incorporating as many muscle areas as I can. I lose less coordination. And so my, my forward muscles, I work on the way up. And then my backward muscles, I can work on the way down, triceps, etc., and do different types of exercises. That's why I do the curl bar, which basically works my forward muscles. And the tricep press over here, I, I don't know if you can see me, the tricep press, this works my stomach, my neck, my traps, my triceps, my lower abdominal. Now if I didn't carry the weight on here that I have, and I didn't make myself, if I didn't make myself, like I crunch myself over a little bit, and I make my abs go to work here, I pull down a little bit with my abdominals. I, I, I bowl myself like this, and then I finish it with the tricep. So I'm working my lower abs, working my chest, tricep, traps, and I'm, I'm making those muscles come into play. Okay. This bag. represents nobody. <laughs> I know what you were thinking. You were thinking, who does that tag represent? And why, every once in a while, does he come up with a big right and try to hurt it? 
Well, I had a prophecy over me once up in Alaska. But, but Lord, I think they're hypocrites. But Lord Jesus, if what this man is saying is true, I want to know you. I want to have a relationship with you. I ask you to forgive me for all the things that I've done that have offended mankind and offended, offended you, Lord. And right now I ask you to come into my life and to anoint me with your spirit and to put your spirit in my heart so that I'll know you. I want to know you, Lord. I want to be an overcomer. I want to overcome the things of this world. I want to overcome selfishness in me. And I want you to raise me up to be a power of good and an influence, a powerful, positive influence in this life. I want my life to mean something. I want my life to stand for something. And I ask that you come into my life right now. If you do that, he will. And you'll have the same spirit that God put in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And you know what? You'll have a lifestyle that's similar. 